with sundials and found out why sundials don't agree with our watches. The other unit on time we couldn't do in, cl in class, but we made a uh, device for telling time at night using the stars. I think it was important to work with the kids at that age. Upper elementary school is a time when children are beginning to really be interested in not just the world around them, but more details of how things work in the world around them. I don't think that we, we said, or certainly I, was trying to turn all the students into scientists. I don't think that would be possible. But there's an awful lot in our everyday life, and particularly in our political decisions, that depend on science. And I think it's important for everyone to be somewhat literate in science. We worry about literacy in other areas, but literacy in science is something that we seem to be rather uh, short on in this country, in the general population. So the more we can do to tell kids that science can be fun, it can be interesting, and keep them involved with it, the better off. Well, I was also asked to talk about astronomy and how things have changed and what the future will be. Things have changed very greatly since I started in astronomy. I spent probably the equivalent of two years of observing to get information, very crude information, on the rel um, how the relative uh, amount of hydrogen in stars compared to other elements changed uh, with the position of the stars in the, in the sky. Uh, I suspected, and it's certainly true, that the stars away from the Milky Way tend to have less uh, hydrogen, sorry, more hydrogen, than do the stars that are in the Milky Way. And I wanted to understand that. Well, the, that's neither here nor there. The fact is, as I say, it took about essentially two years, not continuously, but about that much time. Today, I could certainly do it in two weeks. Our, things have changed so greatly. Why have they changed so greatly? Primarily, the electronic revolution that followed the uh, discovery and, and invention of the transistor. The transistor was an American invention that has certainly changed life for everyone. Particularly in, well, it was the basis of the electronic engine, uh, era and explosion. In astronomy, it's changed it in two ways. First, the Astronomy has been completely revolutionized as a result of the computer, as has, of course, all other elements as in life. We, we, what we used to well, call it the Earth turns. And because the Earth turns, if you're taking a long exposure of something in the sky, and we almost always take long exposures because things in the sky are mostly faint, except for the sun. Uh, and so we have to move the telescope to, to counteract the rotation of the Earth. Well, the way we used to do it was to make a, a support system that pointed along, was parallel to the axis of the Earth, pointed to the North Pole or the South Pole, depending on which some hemisphere you were in. And then we hung the telescope on this, this pole and moved it this way around the pole or this way up and down. Well, for a large telescope, that's a pretty difficult dynamic problem because you're hanging something on a, an angular weight a, a pole that has to be supported with both ends. Well, as a result of the computer, we can now build telescopes in which the axis is vertical. And we can put the telescope on top of the axis and rotate it with a relatively simple uh, meter. The computer then tells the telescope how to keep up with the rotation of the Earth. 
we can't do it like we don't do it by analog. When I did my most of my observing, I did it with a telescope of 82 inches, which at that time was one of the largest telescopes in the world. Today it's classified as a small telescope <laughs> uh, because telescopes have gotten much bigger. They've gotten much bigger for several reasons, but one of the reasons they've gotten much bigger is because you can now mount them this way instead of this way. Uh, you can mount much heavier ones. We've also learned how to make lighter mirrors, but lighter mirrors flex with gravity. The glass is not terribly strong, and it also happens to be a super cool fluid, but that's probably neither here nor there. Uh, but it isn't terribly strong, and so when you have a thin piece of glass and you move it in different angles, as you have to if you're looking at very stars in various parts of the sky, it's going to flex. And so what we've done to counteract that is to put a lot of little pistons in the back of the mirror and again use the computer to keep the mirror exactly the way it should be, a lot of counteracting gravity. And in that way, we can build thinner mirrors and lighter mirrors and bigger mirrors. Uh, that's one of the major advantages of the computer for astronomy. But there's another advantage which is very important, and that is with the modern techniques with the large telescopes uh, and larger detectors, we are getting inundated with gigabits and ter ter terabits of data. And there's no way that a human being could analyze those individual, individual records one by one. The only way we can do it is to put the data into a computer and let the computer do most of the work. The astronomer still has to tell the computer what to do and how to do it, but he doesn't have to do it himself. The second revolution in astronomy that has made observing a lot faster and a lot more efficient is the development of the digital camera, which again was part of the electronic revolution. These are cameras very much like you have in your cell phone or maybe your digital camera, uh, but they were up until actually the Hubble was the first major instrument to use one of these digital detectors in astronomy. Uh, they were beginning to be developed by the uh, television people because they wanted it. But the problem was that they weren't suitable for astronomy when they first started. We had to get them to work for us, and we have. And not only have we gotten them to work for us, they're no longer the little things about the size of your fingernail that they used to be, but they're now quite large. And so you can get an awful lot of information on a single, a single set of detectors or single detector. Moreover, they are about 10 times more efficient, 10 times faster than the photographic film that we were using. So that has been a very major change. The other thing is that um, well, I started to say we, we make bigger, much bigger telescopes. For a couple of decades, maybe more, a 200-inch telescope on Mount Palomar was the biggest telescope in the world. The Russians built a telescope, I think, in the 60s, uh, but it never worked particularly well. I don't know quite what the problem was. So it remained uh, for until about 20 years ago. The 200-inch was the biggest usable telescope. Well, now we're we have 13 telescopes in the world that are bigger than 350 inches. So uh, things have really changed. And we're building bigger ones. I was asked to tell about the future. Well, what, I guess the main things I see as a future is that it's going to be more and more of computerized analysis of data. It's the only way we can handle the data we're going to be getting. The second thing is 
we're continuing to build bigger and bigger telescopes. Ground has already been broken for a telescope in Chile uh, that is going to be mounting a 1,000 inch telescope. And so it's, it's pretty, and there's going to be one in the Northern Hemisphere eventually also. Uh, we're also putting different instruments in. In the space program, uh, you probably have heard of the James Webb Telescope. The Hubble has a 92 inch mirror. The James Webb has a 253 inch mirror. Now, the amount of light that you can collect from a telescope, this goes as a square of its diameter. So a telescope that is three times as big as the, as the Hubble is going to collect nine times as much light. It also will have uh, three times better resolution, so you'll see finer detail. On these bigger telescopes, we're going to put, uh, putting new instruments. One of the tele one of the programs which is just beginning to be in developed is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This is a telescope with a field of view uh, 50 times larger than the, the size, apparent size of the moon. By comparison, the Hubble field of view is one-tenth the size of the apparent size of the moon. So we're talking about 500 times larger field than the Hubble when we talk about this. And it's going to be cover the sky, the whole sky, or at least the whole sky that can be reached from its, its position, and I don't know where it's going to be yet, in every three or four days. So we can see how things are changing on a rapid scale. It will help us find more uh, extrasolar planetary systems, it will help us find more variable stars. It will find supernovae that go off uh, at great distances and show us the early days of the universe. And it will it can watch changes on the planets and the asteroids. As the asteroids turn, we can get more information on their shape and their composition. We'll find many objects out near Pluto that we didn't, don't know now. And so that's one of the exciting things that's coming up in ground-based astronomy. In space astronomy, the major thing that's coming up is the, the James Webb Telescope, as I mentioned. This is not going to be in Earth orbit the way the Hubble is. It's going to be at a point beyond the Earth, beyond, well, from the sun. If we take the scope from the sun to the Earth and then keep going beyond it, you'll get to the point where the Hubble, the James Webb, will live. In that position, it can observe full time. It's not getting into the shadow of the Earth every 90 minutes, the way the Hubble does. Not only that, but it'll be away from the heat of the Earth, and it'll be farther from the sun, so it'll be cooler. Now, that telescope, the Hubble was designed to work in the visible light, the light that you see with your eyes and light that is bluer than you can see with your eyes. The James Webb is going to be primarily looking at light which is redder than you can see with your eyes. And the reason for that is twofold. When we're looking at the very early universe, because of the expansion of the universe, everything is shifted to the red. Uh, so the sun, which has peaks at a uh, a wavelength of 5,000, uh, 5,000 angstroms, 500 nanometers. If you're at a distance of perhaps, we're looking back maybe 12,000, 12 billion years in time, your, your sun is going to look like it's about uh, five or 10 uh, and microns. Micro-millimeters. And so it's going to be in the red. The other thing is, when you want to look for planets or planetary systems, uh, they tend to be cool. And when you're cool, things are brighter in the infrared. And so 
That's another reason why we're anxious to go to the infrared. When we built the Hubble, detectors for the infrared were not very satisfactory, but they've improved a great deal, and we now have good detectors for the infrared. So the James Webb is going to be making use of those to see at very great distances, and also, as I say, to be able to see planets. Planets are, because they're cool, the contrast between a planet and its sun is a bit smaller in the infrared than it is in the visible, which makes it easier to see. And we're hoping with this to be able to get some information on the surfaces and composition of planetary atmospheres. The, beyond the Hubble, beyond the James Webb, the next thing we plan to do in space is another infrared telescope, an infrared telescope with a fairly wide field of view. Uh, and it is going to tend to spread the light from the stars or from anything else that it looks out, looks at, into a strip of rainbow, into a rainbow, basically. And from the details of that rainbow, we can tell what, what it's like, but we can also tell how far away it is by seeing how much the lines that we're familiar with have shifted to the red. And so that's an exciting um, future that's coming, going to be coming up in astronomy. When, I don't know, partly depends on the budget, <laughs> as, as do all things. But uh, it's the, those three large synoptic survey telescope, the ground-based telescope I mentioned, and what's called W-first, this infrared, very versatile infrared telescope for the uh, space program, are the two two, era, two instruments that astronomers have decided that they really want more than anything else. So I think um, that's probably most of what I should say about the future of astronomy. We're going to be using computers. The other thing I should mention, because I think it's interesting, it's not a major thing yet, but astronomy started what's called citizen science. Uh, an astronomer at Hopkins in Baltimore had a job of looking for, for galaxies and trying to decide what class they were, what were their names. Um, were they spirals? Were they irregulars? Were they elliptals? Or were they something stranger yet? And he had a lot of data. And, and this is something you can't do by computer. So he decided he needed help. And he thought, well, on the internet, anybody can do this. I'll just put out a, 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 an invitation for people who are interested to, to look at these, this data and tell me what these galaxies look like. And he was overwhelmed, the response that he got. He, he, he was so overwhelmed that, that he that it crashed the computer system that he was using to crash the internet. Well, that has expanded now. It's being used for a number of other areas in astronomy, and it has also now spread to other areas of science. One of the interesting things is uh, it's an area in which the, is an area in which they are using it to try to develop new drugs. And it's also being used to try to understand how the um, G, uh, the um, DNA holds. And, and there's a number of other problems in other areas, but it started in astronomy, and it's again something that you can do because of the computer. And of course, the internet has also meant that astronomers all over the world can work together more actively than they could before it. Astronomy is a small field as science goes, and so they've always been, it's always been international. But uh, we couldn't, uh, if, we, if we wanted to write a paper, we either wrote it ourselves or we wrote it with people out in the hall. Now it's just as easy to write a paper with somebody in England or, or Germany or Russia or Japan as it is to write it with a person down the hall, and we've seen that more and more. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. I was asked to bring some Hubble slides, which I, and I brought a half a dozen.